funded by the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland with the television licence fee. Ask most people what's the greatest invention of the last 150 years and you'll probably get answers like the airplane or the car or perhaps even the iPhone. However, ask the same question but add the stipulation that it must be an invention which promotes the health of the user and especially the environment without causing any harmful pollution and as you might expect, answers would be less forthcoming. However, there is one invention in the last century and a half which amply fulfills all these conditions. I'm talking about the bicycle. When the modern safety bicycle with pedal cranks attached to its own chain and with pneumatic tyres first began to be sold at affordable prices to the general public from around the early 20th century onwards, it caused nothing less than a quiet social revolution. Stephen Ferguson, historian and also assistant secretary of on post. Essentially it made transport easy and accessible and it expanded horizons in a way which hadn't been done before. Clearly the railways was a, a big transport leap forward for people um, but you still needed a bit of money for that and people were reluctant in some places to take the train they, they stayed at home but the bicycle was something that if you could take a decision on the day yourself if you had a bike if it was a nice day you could decide you were going off to see your aunt or your uncle or your friends some way beyond your local village. Whereas up until then, your experience would have been limited much more to a very narrow horizon. I think we forget nowadays just how close the limits of local Irish life was. The bicycle gave freedom, particularly to younger people, I suppose. And it was a revolution in a way that, um, if you think back, say, the 60s and 70s revolution here in terms of teenager and the invention of the teenager, if we can think back a little bit to the close of the 19th and early 20th century, the bicycle was advertised in all the papers, all the local press, in the post office magazines, for instance, which were internal documents, there were bicycle ads so that people could acquire one for themselves or their family. So it, it expanded horizons and just made travel much easier. It was still an expensive item. People had to save up for it. But it was something that just came within the grasp of many ordinary Irish people, and a lot of them took it up. Once you didn't mind the weather, the bicycle could take you to the local shop, it could take you to the football match, could take you to the parish hall for the dance. And um, it's, it, it's been well established that certainly people were no longer living within their own parish, but that they were finding partners at least 10, maybe 12 miles away. Historian Austin O'Sullivan of the Irish Agricultural Museum in Johnstown Castle, County Wexford. Here's Brendan Hennessy of the old Velo's Vintage and Classic Bicycle Club. Could you imagine, you know, being able to get to places in, you know, relative ease and the, the fact that you can do distance, like just for example, this year, uh, myself and some of the old fellows guys, we did the Ring of Kerry on High Nellies and OK, we might have been slightly slower, but we got there and that's over 100 miles in eight hours, six to eight hours, whatever it was. You know, that's the distance that people could travel. That's immense. The bicycle was such a huge improvement for so many people, ordinary people through the countryside especially, where they were remote from villages, remote from towns. It meant that you could travel, you could go to work, you could go anywhere you wanted to. The bike revolutionised the way people actually went to work, went to school, went to whatever they had to do. It opened up for everybody, the movement around the country. It was a very important development in Irish society. The bicycle is a mechanical marvel, being one of the few structures that can support more than 10 times its own weight. A bicycle works as an almost automatic extension of the human body, giving modern cyclists the ability to exceed the speed of the fastest land animal, the cheetah. Believe it or not, cycling is more popular nowadays than ever before, with countless people throughout the length and breadth of Ireland engaging in cycling disciplines as diverse as open road races, leisure or sport or charity cycles, BMX 
mountain biking and many other types of cycling activities, including one called Cyclocross. I recently attended the Irish National Cyclocross Championships in Glen Cullen Adventure Park in South County Dublin. My name is Kevin Keane. This is the the culmination of the uh, cyclocross season. Mm-hmm. Cyclocross, it's a type of off-road cycling. So it's kind of a bit of a cross between uh, mountain biking and road biking. It's kind of sport which developed mainly in in kind of the Flemish countries in Flanders, and uh, yeah, it was really it was really big in Ireland in the seventies. It's had a real resurgence since the noughties, especially in the states and in Australia and in Ireland as well. Uh, my name's Nessa Rochford. I'm from Duran Van Cork. I just took up cyclocross this year, so it's my first nationals. Congratulations! Thank Nessa. you. Wow. I think I came first in the Masters and seventh overall. So there was two other girls. And it's your first year? Yeah. <laughs> wow, that's brilliant. Congratu- real congratulations, especially on, just you know, on your very first year. Yeah, so I know I'm absolutely delighted. I didn't expect to come there. The very strong athletes here, some great talent. So it was a great event, very mucky, um, but good fun. And Nessa, I was watching the uh, race as it was in progress. I mean, a tough race, hard slog, and very intensive. I mean, what were the big challenges for yourself in the race today? Um, big challenge was the muck. It was very mucky, so you're slipping and sliding. So there was a lot of running to be done, so you're getting on and off the bike, which takes a lot out of you. But yeah, it's enjoyable. I'm absolutely buzzing. <laughs> yeah, it was a great event. It's kind organized. of just a good adrenaline rush, is there? Yeah, yeah, I mean. yeah, yeah. It's great. It's great to be competing with such girls who've been doing it for so many years and there's great talent here. So they all did brilliant and it's a well organised event. So delighted to be here. My name's Michelle Gagan. I'm cyclist <laughs> now, Michelle you came second to the race today a fantastic yeah. achievement I mean a real very very tough race what were the challenges the cyclocross boot was the challenge for me <laughs> I'd very much describe myself as a road rider but uh, with the help of a lot of friends I've kind of gotten a bit more comfortable in the muck I suppose and Michelle what do you love most about cycling yourself for me it's that kind of the feeling you get from just physical exhaustion I think I love like pushing myself as hard as I can and like to the absolute limit and then you're just emptied and like to be honest I think that's the feeling that I'm always chasing and aside from cyclocross another cycling discipline which is becoming very popular is mountain biking Here's who else I met during my recent visit to Glen Cullen. Ben. Aaron. And Jake. Now, what age are you, man? I'm 13. 13? 13. (laughs) Right, and what's happening today? What's the event going on here today? Um, Well, there's a a gravel bike race over there, and we're just here mountain biking, so... Right. What do you love most about the mountain biking yourself, man? Adrenaline rush. (laughs) <laughs> that says it all and Jake the same for yourself adrenaline rush uh, yeah and the jumping I love getting up in the air and trying to do some tricks so kind of it's a real real you know, kick yeah 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 <laughs> really big kick <laughs> yeah. how much of a kick now you know crazy <laughs> <laughs> enough to give you enough energy to go up Mount Everest <laughs> brilliant brilliant that's super I mean it, it's very obvious you love it I and mean, what got you into the, the whole mountain biking in the first place YouTube for me stem my friends <laughs> right okay and men what advice would you have for anyone who hasn't tried the mountain biking yet and they might be just uh, mulling her over the idea any advice to them Go to a bike park and rent a bike, so don't. So you're looking for like what you want and all that. So in other words, test the ground yeah. first before you start putting out money. Yeah, Ben. And try and make your own local trails near your local house, like near where exactly. you live. Yeah. Yes. Just local trails are the best. And where you're living, men, are the good local trails, are there? Well, you sort of have to build them yourself, but when you build them, they're great. And where are you coming from, men? You're Ben yourself. Um, I'm coming from Bot- Count- County Wicklow and Bottom Glass there. Bottom Glass as well? Yeah, all the same. All Bottom Glass, right. So you're not too far away from Glen Cullen here today, no. so it's not no. a far trek. And County Wicklow, good mountainous, mount- obviously mountain bikes, it lends itself to the whole activity. Would I be right, Jay? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Definitely, yeah. <laughs> so just how beneficial is mountain biking for one's health and well-being? 
Well, it gives you responsibility to look after your bike and it helps you build up ener- like energy and feel better and stronger and stuff like that. Yeah, it's just getting out, getting fit and strong and all that. Yeah. Off the computer games and more active. That's the one thing I love about it. What's very clear from prior comments is that many people throughout our modern Ireland love cycling. I really like cycling. I cycle everywhere. The sense of freedom you have as well when you're using your bike, um, cycling is, has a huge benefit. I count myself lucky that I, I just love cycling. I really just, I, I think it's so pleasurable. Sometimes after a stressful day at work, throw your leg over the bike and just go off for a little spin somewhere, maybe hook up with some friends, have a bit of a chat and uh, it's, a, it's just a great activity. You know, there's something about freedom riding your bike and pushing yourself. It's great. I would advise anybody, get on your bike. And we'll hear more from modern Irish cycling enthusiasts later in this programme. But first we need to investigate the historical origins of the bicycle from the 1800s onwards and its eventual arrival into Ireland. Peter Matthews, curator of the Matthews Museum of Cycling History, based in North Dublin. In the very early days, it was just a plank with two wheels on it. And you sat on that and you walked along. And they were called a hobby horse. (laughs) And uh, apparently someone in France said, if you put a grinding handle... On the front wheel, you could use it with your, with your feet and just sit down on, on the bike. So uh, that's how it all started. And uh, that allowed you to propel the bike with, with your feet. And they increased the size of the wheel to get a higher gear. And it went up to about 36 inches. But there were cart wheels, wooden wheels, iron shod and very heavy. The very early bicycles, which really were shod with scaled-down pony trap wheels, complete with an iron band on them. And as you travelled over the sort of roads that were around then, I mean, there was no smooth tar macadam, there were stones, there was rough. You're, you're, it, they were, for no bad reason, called bone shakers, these early bikes. And they really would put you off. Historian Austin O'Sullivan of the Irish Agricultural Museum in County Wexford. Here is Peter Matthews once again. They decided to make a wire wheel and um, then you could increase the size of it for a higher gear. So eventually it turned into the high bike or more popularly known as the, the penny farthing. And that was about 1866. And staying with the penny farthing, here's what Austin O'Sullivan had to say about the one on display in the Irish Agricultural Museum. Penny farthing. Now that was only for the brave, you know, and that was really a precursor of the more regular bicycle wheel. The front and back wheel are the same size. The penny farthing that we're looking at, should the, the main wheel is, must be four or five times the size of the back wheel. And there would be a minimal break, you see, which took, took the form of a little shovel nearly that pressed down against the solid rubber of the tyre. That was your braking system. And um, it was a dangerous vehicle. And really, that was a bit of a man-killer to use. And the next major leap forward in the evolution of the bicycle was the invention of more safer bicycles, such as the kangaroo, in the mid-1880s. Here is historian Muriel Matthews to describe the kangaroo bicycle in the Matthews Museum of Cycling History based in North Dublin. That's the kangaroo, that's the name it went by and it's about half the size of the penny farthing front wheel there and instead of having the big wheel for gearing you had these cogged wheels kind of. Well there were two chains on that there's the other parts of it there on the fork and the chains gave you the gearing it just brought the size down to a more manageable so in other words they were now into a size that's going to be the size that's just 
the pre-runner of the of general the, safety, the safety bike safety size. Bicycle, is, so, yeah. you know, now it's yeah, getting into more user-friendly yeah. and you don't have to be a fall guy to, yeah, exactly. to ride a bicycle. Yeah. Or a header, as the saying. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's a nice-looking bicycle, you know, it's just the shape of the bars and it's a lovely bike. The bicycle as we know it today didn't just occur all at once, as if one single genius created it out of the blue. Instead it was the result of the combined efforts and collective genius of many bicycle enthusiasts throughout the 19th century. One such person was the Belfast based inventor John Boyd Dunlop. In 1887 he invented the first practical pneumatic or inflatable tyre for his son's tricycle, Brendan Hennessy of the old Velos Club. Everybody will know the name of uh, Dunlop, John Boyd Dunlop had made the fantastic, fantastic improvement for all cyclists now, which is the pneumatic tyre. It was because his one of his children struggled on the bike and he saw this as being a way of developing their own cycling. So that's one of the, the great developments in cycling and it has that Irish connection, which is fabulous. So just how did the coming of Dunlop's pneumatic tyre change cycling? South County Dublin based social historian James Scannell. Before this, people were using solid rubber and it, while it was durable, the problems of it fractured, your tyre shredded, but it didn't provide a very smooth ride. The pneumatic tyre made a much smoother ride and I thought that was the great development, of course, that took off then. The pneumatic tyre sort of gave for the smoother ride and that was the big development of Dunlop. The invention by Dunlop of using air as a way of softening the journey was something that effectively made bicycle transport both accessible and popular and comfortable for everybody. Historian Stephen Ferguson. Within a few short years after Dunlop's invention of the pneumatic tyre, bicycles began being mass produced by many cycle companies. As a result, the bicycle quickly came within the reach of most working adults. Austin O'Sullivan. When they began to be mass produced and I suppose that was really only getting properly underway in the early 1900s because you know Europe was beginning to mechanize you know so it became relatively easy to turn out items rapidly because it's a machine who's doing the work now rather than the workman so fairly rapidly the prices of bicycles came down and as they were coming down the development was continuing and um, the working people, I suppose, even if initially they thought they were outside of their reach, they were watching what the gentry had been doing and uh, very quickly were copycatting them. And as a new bicycle craze swept the world, not only men but also increasing numbers of women took up cycling, often against some opposition. James Scannell turn of the 20th century, the bike more or less is now to the format that we have now. We have the crossbar for the men and we have taken it away for the women to accommodate their dress. And you'll always know that in those days there was a distinct difference between the bicycles for the women. They didn't have the crossbar but they had a giant big scoop so to allow for uh, their skirts because for a woman to be seen riding in trousers was considered unbecoming. Didn't worry about the French. The French ladies went around and uh, rode in any sort of garments but in English Ireland you were expected to conform with the normal I mean, there's the story told in 2011 in the census how a woman went into a shop in trousers and the people were horrified to see a woman wearing male attire. Such was the attitude of time. Women were to wear skirts, not trousers. And here's what Muriel Matthews had to say about how early female cyclists helped in their own small way to progress the cause of women's emancipation. If you look at the dress in those days... You had these crinoline things. You had hoops in them, the big things. There's no way you could ride a bicycle with one of them. So the whole dress changed. And then women started getting into these pantaloons, you know, knickerbockers and pantaloons. And oh, they were frowned upon. Of course, this, this was very, very daring and wasn't liked at all. But it gave women freedom. And... As well as that, you had the suffragette movement which was going on at that stage and those people also would have 
change their garb, garb. You know, for you know, for the. I suppose it was more what we now consider we independent. Can, we or dress modern. the way we want to dress, not the way you want us to dress. You know, this sort of thing. So it was the same with the bicycle, and it also gave women the freedom that they weren't depending on people to bring them around in carriages or dog carts or whatever. No, they could get up on their own bike and get there under their own steam. And that gave them an independence which was actually frowned upon by particularly the male you know, men thought women had a place and shouldn't should be stay there, you know. And this Tied was, to the sink. Exactly. <laughs> and you know, this was giving them that little bit of freedom to put their stamp on their life, what they wanted to do. And they did. And it worked. And eventually we got the vote as well. And aside from the mass-produced bicycle contributing to women's lib from the early 1900s onwards... Also during this period, bicycles began to be made for specialist purposes, such as delivering messages. James Scannell. You would take the messenger boy bike, which was a classic example. This was great flexibility because the messenger boy could go to places where you couldn't bring a horse and buggy. It was cheap in the sense you didn't have the worry of saving a horse and feed. So you had all sorts of people specialising in tailor-making bikes, messenger boys. I even seen bicycles made for the army and they had a clip for the rifle where you could cycle into action and carry a rifle. So you had all sorts of companies developing special bikes and trying to sell them for specialist purposes like that. And uh, it just evolved because people saw a niche for the market and they came along and sold it. I mean, they were making special bikes for for the post office. And people might remember years ago, the parcel man who had a three-wheeler bike which was a giant big basket and a little piece that he sat at the back and he just cycled along and he went out once a day to deliver the parcels. Nowadays it's done by van, but people might remember the parcel and you had the same for, for minor deliveries in companies. So yeah, often these were tailor-made locally or they were made by companies. You went in and said, I want a bikes to do this and they made them up. And as James Scannell just touched on, many official bodies saw the merit in using bicycles, in particular the postal service. Stephen Ferguson of Unpost. Bicycles are, for many people, very closely associated with the postman. And certainly older people will just, the image that will come to their mind immediately is of a postman sort of cycling happily on a rural lane, perhaps, with his bag on the front. But the history goes back quite a long time because traditionally postmen would have walked. Back in the late 19th century, there would have been a a long walking route and There would have been obviously a horse maybe as well for some. So when the bicycle came in with the pneumatic tyre, it offered a very convenient mode of transport for the department, post office as it was at the time. And they were quite quick to adopt this new technology, if you like. So from the very late 19th century, there were all sorts of bicycles and tricycles that were tried. Um, There was one particular one, which was one central wheel with four little wheels around it and it was called a a hen and chicks now there weren't very many of them it really didn't work that well but there was the ordinary bicycle and it would have been a sort of a black bicycle with a messenger type rack in the front and that's where the postman had his bag and cycled along there were also tricycles used and parcel tricycles which would have had a big wicker basket in the very front so that parcels and heavier items could have gone into that and that would have been used more in small town areas for parcel delivery. The early bicycles, the the department has always had contracts for the supply of bicycles. So various manufacturers have been used over the years. And the big names are, of course, ones that people would know. Rally has been used. Pashley was a, a, a firm that was used very much. And after independence, when the post office became independent from the rest of Britain, as it was at the time, there was a desire also to use Irish manufacturers if possible. This wasn't always very easy, but Pierce, for instance, which was a Wexford firm largely involved in farm machinery, it produced some bicycles for the department as well. And then over the years, we've we've adapted and just put out to tender for various makes. It always has to be a strong, very steady bicycle, and it has to be able to cope with the rigours of the journey and Irish roads. So up until recent times, of course, we still use bicycles today. The traditional bike is probably the best for a postman to use. You've got to be able to carry the weight, 
bear your own weight, bear the letters, and then get on and off it safely, obviously, stopping and all quite a lot too. So it's still very much an integral part of our operations. Obviously, we've gone transport to road and all this sort of thing as well. Motorbikes were used for a while too. But the bicycle, I think, is something that for people will remain part and parcel of our service. Hello, uh, I'm Paul Redmond. I'm a postman in Churchtown, District Office, Raymer Road. Now, pa- Paul, uh, you've been a postman for how many years? Approximately 36 years. And most of that time, Paul, how long have you been using the bicycle to deliver the post? Pretty much all of that, yeah. So, over, well over three decades? Yeah, to certainly over three decades, yes. And Paul, just, I mean, what do you love most about delivering post by bicycle? I think it's more efficient. Uh, it's quicker because of the nature of the delivery. Uh, I can I can pretty much access most places that I have to deliver to. There is a health factor that has kept me reasonably fit. I'm 60 years of age now, and I can I can still get up on a bike and pedal. And Fantastic! And over three decades delivering yeah, yeah. posts by, by by yeah. bicycle. Yes, I mean, yeah, yeah. So it's a core part of your work, Paul. Well, it is for me personally. I couldn't think of d- doing it any other way. I don't drive and um, even when I'm not working I use a bicycle uh, my own bicycle as part of my uh, lifestyle I can't think of doing anything travel wise without the bicycle and work wise Paul we're doing the uh, interview here in Fleet Street just off O'Connell Street right. uh, on a Thursday afternoon in mid-December but you've been out early morning delivering post what part of Dublin and what were the challenges of today's tasks well I deliver in Plonsky area, Robock Road area, which is a fairly fairly widespread area. It literally covers Black Rock boundaries and uh, the Plonsky Dublin 6 boundaries, so it's, it's fairly spread out. And uh, it's quite far from the office, and uh, I really need the bike. The bike gets me there fairly efficiently, no matter how bad the traffic is. I don't have to worry about that. And uh, the main problems always this year is heavy packages this online shopping has contributed to a lot and because I use a bike I rely on the panniers panniers and we use feeder boxes particularly during the Christmas pressure I have two feeder boxes which take two extra bags I normally have three three bags three to four bags daily during the Christmas so those are the challenges also the weather particularly the weather is really uh, significant uh, we're always hoping that it'll be a dry frost free ice free day but that's not guaranteed Veering away from our modern times and returning once again to the history of the bicycle in Ireland. Believe it or not, Ireland was once home to its own thriving bicycle manufacturing industry. When a bicycle factory was established by Pierce Engineering Works in Wexford Town in the early 20th century. Historian Austin O'Sullivan of the Irish Agricultural Museum in County Wexford. The Pierce's, they saw that the, the bicycle was a significant new invention and they thought to get into that industry and so they built a purpose-built factory to manufacture bicycles. It was about the beginning of the 1900s they went into the business full-on, purpose-built factory, they could do every work in it including the chrome plating and so on. So what range of bicycles did Pierce's produce? They did produce a number of models, and we're looking at two of them here, and they're equivalent. One is the ladies, High Nelly, we call it, which proudly says P and Company on the little bracket that you put your light onto. And you see the gents one, an equivalent one, just has a plain P on it, and it says Pierce stamped on there. And the ladies one from 1909, the gents bike is from 1903. 1903, yes, so they were roughly contemporaneous. And um, strongly made, quite heavy, and therefore relatively inefficient because it was a great advantage for bicycles to be light. And to this day, that lightness has been pursued to extremes, especially, you know, for Tour de France cyclists. You probably find that those bicycles are featherweight. Now, granted, they probably won't last very long, but for the purpose of the racing, they last maybe one race, two races. 
Whereas these bicycles, of course, were being built before planned obsolescence was even been thought about. And people were buying these bicycles for their... We'll probably be paying about 10 or 12 pounds for these ones we're looking at from Pierce's. They're probably expecting at least their lifetime out of them. And very often there was a second lifetime in them, if they were maintained. The Pierce gentleman's one, of course, there was one of those given to Michael Collins, who visited the factory as Minister for Industry and Commerce, and where Wexford had become a place to bring VIPs to see modern industry, because in the early 1900s there were three factories turning out farm machinery and selling them internationally. And there was nothing like it in the Republic of Ireland. You'd have to go to Belfast to see anything comparable to it. So Michael Collins went away with the RIC man's model because he, like the RIC man, was over six foot tall. So he was given this double barred one, which was kind of extra strong but again was expected to serve an RAC man for probably 20 years, even in daily use. However, unfortunately, after just a short while of manufacturing bicycles, Pierce has faced certain insurmountable problems. Austin O'Sullivan. Pierce's, you know, were a bit unfortunate. In theory, like, they had a good product and it was durable, but they were heavily built. They were too dear. Basically, the prices of the English bicycles nearly were halved as the years went by, whereas Pierce's didn't get up the volume production to be able to compete against a product of a similar nature, which is only going to be half the price. The net result being that by the early 1930s, the Pierce Bicycle Factory in Wexford unfortunately closed for good. Thankfully, nowadays in Ireland, cycling is flourishing. Given the climate change issues faced by our modern world, this is welcome news. Climate change is caused by the emission of greenhouse gases from various fossil fuel sources, such as driving a petrol or diesel car. So just how can people personally reduce their carbon footprint? Professor John Sweeney, the former director of the Irish Climate Analysis and Research Unit in Minute University, County Kildare. The first thing about carbon footprints is that we are personally responsible and one of the things that we do of course is we drive far too much and uh, it's a bit hypocritical of me to start talking about that because I'm as guilty as anybody else but we know in Ireland that um, half of the journeys that people make are uh, less than five kilometres in their car and about one journey in five in Ireland is less than two kilometres which people drive and And these are things which uh, I think people could reduce their carbon footprint on very easily indeed, either by walking or in particular by cycling. Um, If you look at the specs for a new car, you'll see that typically they emit around about 100 grams of carbon dioxide for every kilometre they drive. And that means if you drive a car, say, 10,000 kilometres in a year, you are personally responsible for putting a tonne of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. Now that's quite a lot if you think of what a tonne of gas actually looks like. It's a very substantial, you could fill a fair size balloon with it. So these are areas where by cycling in particular, by walking more, you can eliminate a lot of unnecessary greenhouse gas personal contributions that you make. And of course, there are many areas of saving energy in the home. Uh, There are many areas also of saving energy on on waste uh, as well, which you can do. But I think for most people, the most easily accessible form of reducing your carbon footprint is simply to get out and cycle and walk a bit more, because these are two activities which have zero emissions associated with them. And you're also doing your bit, of course, to help your own health and at the same time as as helping the health of the planet in these areas. And it was with prior speaker John Sweeney's advice in mind that I recently met up with various commuter cyclists in Dublin City to ask them what are the big benefits of cycling to and from work and leaving the car at home. I'm Mark Halpin from Limerick, uh, living in Dublin now around 14 years. Yeah. And Mark, you're working in the city centre, but you're commuting by bike, am I right? That's right, yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah, every day. Right, and Mark, what are the benefits now for yourself of cycling to and from work each day? 
Uh, well, first of all, just from a fitness perspective, it's brilliant. Like you know, obviously it's very cheap. You know, in terms of petrol and cars, it's quite expensive, and environmentally, it's brilliant as well. And also, I, I think it's great de-stress factor when you're coming in and out to work. The fresh air is brilliant. Like you know. In other words, you know, you're there, you're after having a long day at the office. Yeah, yeah. You get out, you get in the fresh air, and mom and nature yeah. works her magic. Would I be right? Oh, yeah, 100%. Yeah, yeah. The last thing you want to be doing is stuck in traffic and uh, getting stressed out in the car when you've had a long day already at the office. Hi, my name is Claire. Now, Claire, what are the benefits of commuting by bicycle for yourself? Well, for me, it's actually I get in quicker and can predict the time that I get in and get home at. That's a major benefit for, for me. Also, the cycling wakes me up, <laughs> either coming into work or going home so afterwards. Kind of it's not just the time you're saving time, but it's also the health factor as well. Yeah, but the time would be the major reason that I have even started doing it and really why I kind of keep it up, to be honest. Right, and Claire, what kind of distances are you doing in and to and from work now? Um, I do just over eight kilometres each way, so I'm not going too far really. It's, you know, it's half an hour, 25, 30 minutes on the way in because it's city cycling and then about 30 to 40 minutes on the way home, depending on the wind and just it's a little bit of more of a gradient on the way home. What words of advice, Claire, would you have for anyone who's listening in who might be thinking, OK, I'll take up this cycling to and from work and I'll leave the car at home? Well, for me, I suppose I started with the Dublin bikes and I got used to cycling around the city and just getting used to traffic, getting used to lanes and stuff like that because I'm from down the country and hadn't cycled since I was in school. So, you know, I hadn't cycled really in a big city like this. But the Dublin bikes really got me used to it and kind of got me thinking that I'd be able to do this. And I suppose the advice would be just get out there and do it because it's not actually as hard as you think it's going to be. You're not having any impact on the planet by cycling. You're not burning fossil fuels or anything like that. So many more people are using it in towns and cities for commuting, cutting out, putting cars on the road. You're only using your own natural energy to propel the bicycle. You're not consuming the world's resources. I mean, that's the great good news. All it is is a frame with two wheels. There's no engine or any other part of it. Bowl of porridge in the morning, that's the fuel that you require to get yourself into the work. Or commuting to work, um, if you're going to the shop, take your bike, even walk. You don't even have to cycle, you know. It's, if we all just contribute a small bit, it will make significant changes in the long run. staying with commuting by bike to and from work, Martin O'Dillon had these words of advice concerning safety for anyone who might be thinking of taking it up. Keep yourself well lit, try and stay visible on the road, don't make any kind of surprise gestures or movements to off-put any motorists, because I suppose at the end of the day you have to remember that you're the vulnerable one on the road. Motorists should probably take more precautions for cyclists on the road. But just be careful, the same way any other person that's using the road should be careful. Cycle safety has become such an issue now. And be careful and clear signals on the bike is the main thing and be seen. The whole visibility thing is very important because if you're not seen then you could be in trouble. I would say really bright colours, whatever you're wearing, bright colours, bright bike even makes a massive difference. Always be vigilant and always assume the worst and always take care. And as various prior speakers mentioned a short while ago, Cycling can be very beneficial for one's health and well-being, as opposed to being stuck in a car. Professor John Sweeney.
I think we can sometimes get insulated from the real world sitting behind the steering wheel of a car. And uh, when you're out in the fresh air in a bike, for example, uh, you're much more in contact with the natural world, with the real world. You hear and see things that you simply wouldn't see or hear from a car window. And uh, as well as that, of course, you're exercising, maybe subconsciously, you're using up some of those calories that you consumed at breakfast and dinner and you're doing your bit to stave off maybe health problems later in your life Uh, you're doing your bit also to tackle what is an emerging obesity problem especially for young people and especially for school going kids one of the things that that always strikes me is, is the amount of cars you see clogging up the roads around schools and in many ways you know many of those school children could cycle or walk to school more easily than being cosseted and driven very very short distances sometimes in a car and recently i met up with two young school goers and their dad in suburban dublin to get their views on cycling to and from school my name is peter and these are my kids jasper and juliana say my hi hi jasper hi hi great great and jasper what school are you going to sherry banks great and who's your teacher owen and what about yourself juliana I get to the same school as my brother. I'm in second class. I have also a male teacher. And how do you get to and from school each day, Julia? I go on my dad's bike usually. Great. And what do you like about it now? I like that I run the car and that it's not um, like it's. I thought, find it like more interesting and I can, It's easier to see like trees and it's also a little bit more cool. Um, kind of like, so you get a little bit of a breeze in your face, kind of. That's good, that's good. And how about yourself, Jasper? Do you like going to and from school by bicycle now? Yes. What do you like about it? That we're early for school. That's really, really good. And it's very important to be early, isn't it? Yes. That's super, super. And Peter, for yourself, what are the benefits? Well, being on the bike means that you're uh, in control of how when, when you get somewhere. And um, generally, it's uh, the route from our house to school is pretty easy. So it's easy to, uh, to kind of forecast what time you're going to get there. Uh, mostly, we go through the park and uh, end up uh, at school within about 10 minutes. That's uh, great, great. Yeah. So kind of, you know, and not only that, but you're getting plenty of fresh air as well. Yeah, yeah. so it's good for, you're feeling good, aren't you? Uh, yeah, I feel very good and... Like in a car, I sometimes feel kind of strange in my tummy, and so I prefer to be on a bike. And w- would you have any advice to listeners out there, Peter, who might be tuned in, who might be thinking, you yeah, well, maybe I might deliver the kids to and from school by bicycle? Any advice from your experience? Sure. L- learn to be confident on the bike. And uh, I, mean, I grew up cycling, that makes it easier. But once you're comfortable, it's pretty easy. And uh, up to a certain age, they're now getting to an age where they're a little bit heavy on the bike, but still doable. I wouldn't keep in your fit, Peter. Yeah, exactly, exactly. It makes it makes it makes it for good exercise in the morning and sometimes in the afternoons too. And as was touched on at the beginning of this program, each year hundreds of cycling events are run throughout the island of Ireland. In disciplines as diverse as road races, leisure or sport or charity cycles, mountain biking, and the list goes on and on, since cycling is continually growing in popularity. For example, BMX biking is booming. To find out more, I attended a junior BMX racing event held recently in Courtown BMX Club in County Wexford. My name is Emma Lang and I'm the secretary of Courtown BMX Club. Now, Emma, what is Courtown BMX Club all about? Basically, it's about getting the kids on the track together to have fun, make friends. They race on race days, but they come off, they high five and they're back rolling in the muck and being friends again. Brilliant, brilliant. So it's all about community, getting yeah. people together and getting them on the bikes and out there, out there activity. Yeah. yeah, getting them out, getting them active, getting them away from Xboxes and hanging around. A big, big issue in our modern times. And Emma, just today now, what exactly is happening today? What event here at the BMX track here in North County Wexford? Today is round two of our winter series. And we've 30 riders that are going to take part from age four right the way up to 40 plus. 
they'll race today and then they'll have the final race in two weeks where they'll then be awarded with trophies and medals and certificates. Very good. So there's a lot of activity going on. Yeah. There's going to be a lot of competition and good fun as well. Now, I was up having a look at the track there. Just a very impressive BMX course. Give a word picture to our listeners of what challenges are the riders are going to have to face today. <laughs> One another is their biggest challenge that they're going to have. But um, it's basically, it's it's them racing themselves from start to finish. Look, they race as teams and as individuals, but it's good fun for them. Right, good fun and getting out there yeah. and plenty of fresh air and it ain't rocket science. Yes, and it's, it's an intense, fast-paced race. I'm talking with a few good men. First of all, who am I talking? My dad, Mal. Oh, yeah, Malik, is it? Yeah. Len Neville. Charles Callum. Jack Whitley Harvey. Now, guys, what do you love most about BMX? And what does it about BMX for yourself? It's fun and you have to get stuck in. It's active to get your legs moving. It's fun to pass people. Like, to, like, get past them in the turns. Right, and I mean, when you're out there, you know, what are the challenges of getting around the track as quickly as possible, but as fun as possible and as safe as possible as well? Well, yeah. So, just try your hardest and go out there. Just do it. You have to try, like, not get into the wet that much so you don't get soaked and get your legs cold. And just have fun while you're doing it. If you fall down, then just get straight back up. If you're just starting, try avoid like not manual or jumping. Like manualing is like where you pull up your the front of your bike, and then jumping is like whipping and all. So you like you go over the jumps and like you're off the ground. Right. So in other words, get into the rhythm of the actual circuit itself and hit the bumps at the right kind of rhythm. Would I be right, man? Yeah. Yeah. Now look at little guys. There's a lot of listeners who are tuned in and they're saying to themselves, you know what? I'd like to take up that sport that Maliki or Len and the other guys are doing. Any advice to people out there who might be thinking of starting this sport? Yeah. There's some tracks around like Imrataw, Lucan, Cork Town, Cork, like Northern Ireland and Lisburn, like all over Ireland. And have you been to many of these tracks yourself, Lennon? Yeah, it's all over Ireland. We're doing like nationals and it's, it's all over Ireland. At what age are you, Len, yourself? I'm nine and a half. So you're loving it. You're really loving this sport. Brilliant. You're getting all over the place. You're cycling. You're meeting up with different people from everywhere. Brilliant, yeah? It's really fun. Like you're there making you new friends like every we'll day while you start. Eyes. And you like you get to meet like loads of new people every time when you come, and like it's just fun when you're doing it. Yeah, and Malik, you were gonna say something. Yeah. We're racing nine to ten. I shouldn't be really in it, but I'm only eight. But still, I really like it, and you can make loads of friends. So I advise you to come over and do it. So, men, you have one final thing to say. What's that you have to say? In recent years, participation by men and women of all ages in all types of cycling disciplines has increased enormously. Here's another die-hard cycling enthusiast that I met at the recent Irish Cyclocross National Championships held in Glen Cullen Adventure Park in South County Dublin, which was mentioned earlier in this programme. Again, cyclocross is cross-country cycling in a closed circuit. I'm uh, Ray Beers from Andrum Town, Northern Ireland, obviously. Well, this is the Cyclocross National Championship, the biggest race in the cyclocross calendar in, in Ireland. And I've been down and was competing actually in the M50 race. Actually, I'm an M60, but they don't have a category for M60, so we were competing in the M50 race. Well, how did you get on? So I well, finished second, second today. Congratulations, so. well done. Thanks very much. Yeah. And what, how, what were the challenges of the race for yourself, Ray? Well, a lot of fast guys that were a lot fitter and younger than me. Um, the main uh, challenge was, was really the course. Um, it's cut up a bit from yesterday. It's very mucky, and there's a lot of climbing in it. And when there wasn't climbing, you were sort of trying to drive through the the mud. So it was a tough course, tough course. Right, well, and a 
Uh, Ray, what age are you yourself? Well, I'm, I'm six, 61 and a half <laughs> at the minute. But unfortunately, the guy who beat me was actually more than that. So uh, well, we better catch him up today. Yeah. And uh, tell us, uh, Ray, of, when did you first get involved in cyclocross activities yourself? Yeah, well, this is just actually my second year on cyclocross. I've uh, been mountain biking probably for almost 20 years. And then I sort of stopped mountain biking a bit a few years ago and um, just kind of took up cyclocross in the winter because I've been doing a lot more kind of road riding in the, in the summertime. Right, so, so it's uh, kind of cyclocross winter, road riding the summertime because the roads are yeah. ice-free, frost-free, yeah. you know. Yeah. So, so you, you love cycling? Yeah, so cycling cycling's what, we're, what I sort of do now. Eh? Two national champions coming in together. A national champion junior and a national champion in the women's. Lara Gillespie over the line. Alexa, I'm Lara Gillespie. Now, Lara, what have you been doing today here in Glencullen at the cyclocross event? Um, it's the national champs for um, women, so I was in that. I'm actually in the junior category, but there's no junior category at the moment for girls. So I was in the women's, and today's the national champs. For now, how did you do? Uh, I won. <laughs> Congratulations. I mean, you say it in a matter of seconds, but I was watching the race. I, very competitive, very tough, and you won. Wow, well done. Thank you. Yeah, it was a really tough race. Um, we had a rider, Maria, who came from America, who was very uh, hopeful to win this year. So, I, And there's a really good field out today, so I was quite nervous starting. And then just as you get into the race, just got stronger and stronger. So. And you're only 16 years of age. Yeah, just turning 17 in April. Aside from competitive cycling events such as the National Cyclocross Championships, many people are joining cycling clubs for leisure and social purposes. Here's a taste of what happened to me at the recent 100km Sportif, organised by Bar Wheeler Cycling Club in New Ross, County Wexford. By the way, for those of you not in the know, a Sportif involves participating cyclists completing a set route. I'm talking with two good women here now who have just finished the event. You've just come in on the bikes. I'm very much in admiration. Who am I talking to, first of all? Uh, Amy Newins and Pauline O'Sullivan. Amy and Pauline, what club are you with yourself? We're with KBK Velo Club. They're in Kilmockridge, Gorey County, Wexford, yeah. And for yourself, women, I mean, what is it about cycling that does it for yourself? That here you are, out on the bikes on a Sunday, involved in a sportif. What do you love most about cycling and events such as the Sportive today? Yeah, I think it's it's kind of more the social side of it. You get to meet an awful lot of new people, especially on, on a Sportive like this. We're in a club, you know, we have kind of a, a good gang of people anyway, but you'll meet new people along the way. So very social. Yeah, that's the main part of it for me anyway. And obviously I get my exercise in. Yeah. And maybe a coffee break as well. Would it be right in certain days anyway, certain events? We love the coffee. But yeah, very much so. It's all about the coffee, really. <laughs> we won't go if we don't get the coffee. <laughs> coffee is core, Coffee's isn't it? Coffee is core, yeah. yeah. That gives you the buzz. Yeah. For yourself, aside from the coffee, Amy, I mean, what does it for yourself about the cycling, you know, that you're out here today and living it? Same as Pauline said, it is definitely the social element. I'm only new at the club in September and already I feel I've got to know a lot of people I didn't know and whatever. Um, I think mental health-wise now it does a lot for me as well, so... I find it good to be out on the bike for that. So, yeah, so no, it's just, it's just something you either like or you don't, and I enjoy it. And I also asked Amy just how good was cycling for one's health and well-being. Well, I suppose it's just the releases endorphins, like and like that you're talking and laughing to people and having a joke along the way, so you forget about your own problems for a while, like, you know, and so it seems to be a good social club, like they do coffee, cake, runs and they do what's that muffin mosey at christmas so they have an event where we all kind of meet up as well so it's good from that social point of view absolutely and you're out there you're oxygenating the body you're breathing in the fresh air it's coming at you hard and strong it ain't rocket science and any opinions yourself yeah no i would agree with amy yeah absolutely yeah it's very good for the mental health and i think everybody i think everybody needs that i think genuinely some kind of exercise whether it's running whether it's cycling as I said, it just happens to be cycling for us. And then obviously I have children that hopefully we can encourage them to do a bit of exercise as well. So it's good, good all around. And after my rendezvous with Amy and Pauline, 
I next got talking with David O'Sullivan, one of the founding members of KBK Velo Club, and posed him the following question. What was the inspiration behind setting up the Velo Club well, I suppo- in Kilmuckle? Yeah, I suppose basically the, the, the main drive behind the club was to get people out cycling. We have a massive issue in this country with mental health. And to get people out and physical fitness combined with the exercise and it, it definitely reduces anxiety and depression. So we, the basic principle behind the club is to get people out cycling and they're, they're better, they're fitter. Health-wise, exactly. physical-wise, every aspect Social, of life. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's a no-brainer. Exactly, it's a no-brainer. And we had a massive take-up. Like We set up the club in 2015 and we had uh, the, the height, we had about 43 or 4 members. Uh, we're down to about 30 regular members now, which often happens. But no, we're definitely a, we're going from strength to strength in the club. Which brings you to the next question. I mean, there's people out there that are listening and they're probably saying to themselves, you know, I wouldn't mind taking up cycling. Any advice to anyone who wants to go down that route? It's a great resource, Cycling Ireland website. Cycling Ireland are the governing body for cyclists in the country. And they have approximately 30,000 members. Most cycling clubs are affiliated with Cycling Ireland and will develop and bring on new people as they end. So any, if they log on to the Cycling Ireland website, there's uh, loads of clubs in every county in the country. So that's where I would say to go to. There's no lack of clubs out there and obviously different clubs are doing different activities for all age categories and all paces, so to speak. Would I be right? Um, yeah, definitely. We have two groups in our club. We have a leisure group, which when they start off, they do somewhere up to about 30k at a nice pace, stop for coffee, enjoy the social element. Then you have a touring group which do train for the likes of our event today here. And um, But it's amazing because we have some of our leisure group who would have started only the last couple of months at 20, 30k, have done the 80 to 100k today. So it's, it's, and not only that, but done very well. I yeah. was talking with a few of them earlier on. I'm loving it. Yeah, definitely. They all get a buzz. You never come off a bicycle in bad form. You always come off in good form. You always get the buzz. So it's, um, it's important, I think, for everybody to, to try and keep a little bit healthy. When I was a young boy growing up in the 1970s, I used to love watching a TV series called A Bionic Man, about a man with a body which was part bionic machine, and as a result, he possessed superhuman strength. Although that was television fantasy, what isn't fantasy is bionics, the symbiotic merging of a cyclist and his bicycle, or, put another way, the happy union of human and machine into an efficient, eco-friendly and extremely healthy means of transport. Like many people ever since I learned to cycle from a very early age, I've had a long and healthy love affair with it. I'm going to leave the last few comments with various cycling enthusiasts extolling the benefits of cycling. It's definitely an ideal pursuit for many and not mad expensive either. It's a cheap and healthy way to get out, get your fitness and get your buzz at the same time. It's about just getting out on your bike, being on your bike and making new friends. Have a bit of crack and you don't have to take anything seriously. If you just start out, go out, get a bunch of mates and go out and enjoy riding your bike. Just getting out and getting active. Join your local club and have lots of fun. As soon as I'm on the bike, then I'm happy. I would advise anybody, get on your bike. Funded by the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland with the television licence fee.